first of all, thank you all for coming. I, I bet you're here more for the free Chick-fil-A than you are to hear me, and that's okay. Um, I was thinking back, If I feel like I'm in a big living room with all my friends because I know most of y'all. If I don't know you, I'm Glenn Tudor. I've been here since 2012. And just to think about the university in the past roughly decade, there was a moment, and my good friend and colleague, um, Mark Elliott will confirm this. There was a moment in time where Mark Elliott and Glenn Tootle were the only two water faculty in civil engineering. Now look at what we have today. We have Prabhakar, are you here? There he is, leading a major NSF award. We have Hamid leading a major NSF award. We have Steve Burian leading a major NSF award. We have Hamed, who's going to be running late, just receive an NSF career award. Who am I messing? We just have had so much occur in this last 10 years. It's been amazing. And let's not forget, we have this thing called the National Water Center that's opened on our campus. We have the USGS HIF that's about to open on our campus. You may, you may have heard about this very, very small research project called Cairo. It's only like 300 million or something like that. Another thing that Steve's managing. I, I need to see your pharmacist to figure out how you do all this. Um, the, uh, that going on. And then of course, who's here today sponsoring us? The Alabama Water Institute. And as I say, this talk is free, so you do get what you pay for um, in that. But again, what a place we're at at the University of Alabama and how fortunate we are to be here. Um, I got great news and I got so-so news. The great news is, is I'm only going to talk for 26 slides, not 126, 26 slides. The bad news is if I fall over and start twitching, I had, come on in, we like food especially Chick-fil-A food. Um, if, I, if I start going, I made the mistake yesterday in a moment of weakness that I had both my flu and my COVID shots. And I am feeling it right now. I could lay down on the floor right now and be very, very happy. Okay, so sorry I'm not my normal spunky self here today to go through all this. But what I want to talk about, I know, I know Zach's really good at wearing the, uh, the uh, cloud suit. I feel like I need to get me a NASCAR suit to put on with all these emblems and sponsors up here. But I do want to recognize them and also some people at the end of this. So I'm going to talk about the research hypothesis and why we do this, how we've been doing it in the US, how we've taken it over to Europe, and then what we're doing now and doing that. And again, this is kind of like, if you have questions, interrupt me. We're going to get done in plenty of time for y'all to get to either your class, back to work, or most importantly, a happy hour somewhere in Tuscaloosa. All right. Now, simple. I tell my students, I'm a product of poor public southern education. If I can do it, it ain't that hard. It's a pretty simple hypothesis. Tree rings can extend the instrumental record into the past. I'm going to pass around some tree rings. Let y'all take a look at some of this stuff. I'll start over with y'all. I'm do a couple of these here and a couple of these with y'all. And, you know, I went back to school very late in life. I started when I was 40 for a PhD, 2002. And I was coming off a two-year recall with the military and did my PhD in three years, got a job immediately, didn't have to postdoc, didn't do nothing with paleo in my PhD, but I dabbled a little bit in it. And this wonderful woman, Connie Woodhouse, was at CU Boulder, and she heard I was dabbling in it, and I was up the road at University of Wyoming, and she said, Glenn, come on down, I'll do a workshop for you and teach you how to do this. And I still have in my office, you can't read this, but it says Technical Workshop on Tree Rings, May 17th, 2000 and 
I can't even read it. 2006 in Boulder. So went down there for about a week with students, and this lady trained me, and she's kind of my mentor in this. She's at University of Arizona, about to retire, was just named a fellow in AGU a couple years ago. Just, I want to acknowledge her because I wouldn't be doing this without her just saying, come on down, I'm going to teach you how to do this. And it changed my whole career path, just this one random meeting, so to speak. And I want to mention that. It, again, it's pretty simple. If the ring is wide and you have a lot of moisture and the ring is narrow and you have a little bit of moisture, we can assume the moisture behaves like the tree. And since the tree is older, we can go back in time. Pretty simple. Now, I'm an engineer, allegedly. And I like practical stuff. I don't want to do all this, and what are we going to do with it? All right? So why, why do we do this? Well, I don't call Twain a writer. I call him a philosopher. Um, great quote. In fact, Ed Clark on last Friday, where's the students, NRT kids? As I, I call y'all kids in a nice way. I have four of my own. Um, he made this quote, and I was laughing because I was like, going, I already had that in my slide. Um, whiskey is for drinking worse. For fighting over the Colorado is the great example of where paleo would have been useful, in that they divvied up this watershed, and they said we got 16.5 million acre feet. Well, they based that on about 20 years of record. This blue blob here. Now again, this isn't the Colorado. What I'm showing this is the Green River. And the reason I'm showing this is one of my former students did this. And you'll know more about this in a moment. The green mirrors the Colorado. So right now it's the 1920s. We're doing the Colorado River Compact. We're going to divide up the water with the upper basin, lower basin states, and da 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 da. And we got 16.5 million acre feet. How do we know that? We just look back the last 20 years. That's what we have. Okay, let's do it. Well, fast forward. What ends up happening is this is what we've seen since that time. The first Dust Bowl the second Dust Bowl, a little bit of a pluvial time, and what we've been seeing up until a few atmospheric rivers hit this past year, a big drought in the Colorado River. Well, guess what? If you'd had tree ring data, this is what you would have seen. And again, this is the Green River, which mirrors the Colorado River, and this was one of my former students paper, Anthony Barnett, and you'll see a picture of Anthony here in a moment. In fact, those samples, I'm passing around our Anthony's work. This is what you see with tree rings. You see when you go back in the past, holy cow, wow, we had some serious droughts. They've had, and I know Mike's here, he studies um, Native Americans, indigenous. They've, these, these tribes disappeared. They're like, what happened? Did they get a disease? Did they kill each other off? They got thirsty. They had to go find water. And this is what this, this work tells us in doing this. So again, boy, what bad timing of the Colorado in that you pick the most robust time to allocate the water. And we just didn't know that. Well, breaking news, this is this year. I know you can't probably read the dates. April 11, 2023. Down here is uh, July, May of 20. This paper came out, notice the second author, Connie, and they said, you know what? The Colorado is in one of the worst droughts based on paleo records we have seen. Something has to be done. And the White House took action, and now, after 100 years, the Colorado River Compact is being redone. And I know I have my legal scholar, Bennett Bearden here that can explain that laws much better than I ever can. But this is what's happening. And again, why, what kind of got this going was this tree ream work that showed how bad the drought is historically and what needed to be done and that the Colorado River just does not deliver as much as we thought it did. So again, this is why I will say we use this. You'll see also in a moment, if you notice the last author is a guy, a gentleman named Dave Miko, 
You'll see Matt Miko, his son, in some photos here in a moment. Matt actually did his master's with uh, Dr. Matt Therrell, my colleague, that we do a lot of this research with. So again, it's a pretty good little family that we've developed here. So what's the first steps? Okay, I'm a retired military guy, had to spend a lot of time in tents. I like to send my young, fit students out to do this, or Matt Therrell. Um, you got to collect the samples, the things that I just point, uh, passed out to y'all. Now, it's a pretty simple process. You have one of these things called an auger, core, and you'll take the little spoon out of this thing. Hopefully it'll come out. This one sticks sometimes. And it's sticking good for me today. I'll get it out eventually. I should have brought my other one, I guess. But you want to beat on this for me? See if you can get out. And you take these, the auger and you go out, and first of all, you need to find a moisture sensitive tree. You need to find a stress tree. And of course, you need to find an old tree because it doesn't help you if the tree's not old. Thank you, if I don't let it go back in here again. And I'll pass this around. Um, don't stab your neighbor or anything like that. So this is the one time I really like having this. Mike, you're our structural engineer. Reinforced concrete column? <laughs> okay. Um, you would go up to the tree and you go about chest high, why? Because you can get most of your weight behind it. And you basically put this into the tree and you core into the tree. And then usually we do a couple little turns back to kind of loosen it up. And then we'll put this spoon in it. You'll see it when I pass around, it has little grooves on the end. And it'll pull out the sample. And you will find a stand of trees that are moisture sensitive, stressed and old. You'll pull maybe two samples each. It does not hurt the tree. Glenn, can you core the column first one more time? Sure. <laughs> Should I look like the mad, the mad engineer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, so you find this stand of trees, you go, you core them. We use this real high technology of uh, paper straws to put them in. You basically seal them, you'll mark them log them in your field book, and you just go and you take about two, maybe three per tree, collect all this data, you bring it back. I pass some of the samples you'll see are still round, some have been sanded. Count the number of years, measure the widths, throw all this in these two statistical packages, one's called Coficha, one's called RSTAN, and it'll spit out a master chronology. That's what we use to reconstruct. Again, some of these samples, it'll throw out. Why? The tree, that one sample I'm passing around here, the longest one, I don't know who has that right now. Karen has it, 789 year old tree ring, right there from Wyoming. So it'll throw some of them out when it's building the master chronology because it'll say, oh man, this 20 years is bad. What happened? Maybe it got hit by lightning. Maybe it got a bug in it. So it'll throw some out, it does all this magic, you get this master chronology. We'll use a lot of these master chronologies. So thanks to my friends at the Geological Survey of Alabama, when I first came here way back in 2012, they gave us a seed grant, like 50,000 I think it was, maybe 75, and they said, we want y'all, we like this, we want to try this in Alabama. I said, okay, well guess what? Matt and I, um, I as lead PI with the NSF award, Matt Thurow as lead PI with the EPA Gulf of Mexico uh, program, hit on two awards almost simultaneously to where we started doing all this work in the Southeast United States and looking at interstate stream flow and reconstructing streams in the Southeast. Just hadn't been done that much. The West is very robust in doing this. The South hasn't been, why? We got a lot of moisture. I haven't worried much about water, other than the Apalachical and Chattahoochee Flint Wars that we've had going on. So we took off and started doing this. And again, I mentioned the tree rings 
how we have to get that data. The other thing is this is what the field looks like. This is a trip down on the Choctahatchee River, if y'all are familiar with that, in the southeast part of Alabama. So this is Matt Therrell is the primary lead. I think we had about seven students going down on this trip. That's actually Matt Miko I mentioned earlier, whose father, Dave, is a well-known dendro person out in the field. This, we wrapped up our uh, the NSF award this past summer, we got a supplement and took seven undergrads to uh, near Orlando and we cored trees as part, of, as part of an NSF REU. And you can see, this is actually, Matt's lab I think is, Sagi would know better than me, I think it's now relocated to probably Bevel or uh, to, uh, to Shelby. But it was right above us here, maybe it's still in there, I hadn't been in it this semester. But this is the students in Matt's lab doing the processing that I was talking about, sanding it, dating it, measuring it to get that sample. So that's the tree ring side of this. Y'all still with me? Am I putting you to sleep yet? Y'all okay? All right. So you got to have the tree rings. The other thing you got to have, which is really nice, that corresponds with work is stream flow. Before I get to that, there, NOAA, so it's really nice that we're here. NOAA maintains one of our databases. You're about to see USGS maintains our other database. So all this data is maintained by NOAA in the tree, International Tree Ring Data Bank. That's Anthony, I mentioned earlier, Barnett. That's Tom. They both published their papers doing this work in Wyoming. Those samples are literally the ones that Anthony and Tom were coring while I stood there probably watching, being a good, good, good uh, manager. And uh, if you Google, or excuse me, not Google, go to this tree ring site and put in Barnett or Watson, their samples were submitted to NOAA. They were basically went through the process of being approved. And they're now on the data bank. If anybody wants to use these, it's a way of sharing the information with people. On the flip side, we have to have a moisture signal. Is it stream flow, precipitation, snowpack, soil moisture? Sure, we can look at all of them. We as engineers love stream flow. Why? That's what goes through dams. That's what goes through operations. We like looking at stream flow. So the way this game works is we have our tree rings and we have our stream flow. We do some pre-screening. And then now we've been using primarily regression models. Matty Brake here in the front just gave me a really bad look because Matty Brake's doing a lot of regression of tree rings and stream flow. So, no, nah, she's a great student. Then we end up getting this reconstruction model. We check the skills. We may have skill statistics. We have the bias corrected, and that's when you get this time series. Okay? Again, challenges. Do we have tree ring chronologies? Are they old? Are they moisture sensitive? Are they recently cored? Remember, a lot of this stuff may have been cored in the 80s. What's well, cored in the 80s? Can I use stream flow from the 90s, the 2000s, the 10s, and 20s? No, because the tree ended in the 80s. I'd have no overlap. So a lot of the work we'll do is go update samples. If it's a really good moisture sample, it was cored in the 80s, we'll go gather it and bring it up forward so we get more of an overlap with more recent records. The other challenge we have, which is our friends now, we got NOAA who maintains our tree ring data sets, USGS who maintains our stream flow data. Do we have stream flow records? Is it unimpaired? If you're not familiar with that term, is it a natural flow? We can't be doing this with something that's got diversions, impoundments, and all this stuff going above the gauge. It's not representing what's naturally there. And is there sufficient overlap, as I just mentioned? If the tree's cored in the 80s, and my stream flow goes back to the 60s, and only have about 20 years of overlap, we probably can't get that through the peer review. Say, nah, that's not enough. You don't have enough overlap. Do that. So again, USGS is who we get this data from. They have two wonderful publications. About every 20 years, they go out and look at gauges and deem them unimpaired, or not unimpaired. And so there's two studies they put out that we use to look 
and see if they say this gauge is impaired or unimpaired. And then, of course, we go to the NWIS website and pull this data down. That's how we do a reconstruction. Am I keeping you, keeping you alive here? Y'all okay? All right. So now I'm going to confuse you. All right. This is probably the most important slide of my only 26, not 126, only 26 slides I'm doing today. A fantastic dendro scientist named Ed Cook is up at Columbia, and he works with another phenomenal uh, engineer scientist, Manu Law. And Ed decided in, I think this was published in 2010, he decided to do this thing called the North American Drought Atlas. What the heck is the North American Drought Atlas? Well, Ed had Palmer drought points randomly. Picture, picture y'all guys, you're a Palmer drought point, you're a Palmer drought point, you're a Palmer drought, you're a Palmer drought. And then he also had tree ring data. Maybe you're a tree ring, and you're a tree ring, and you're a tree ring. Mike, you're a tree ring. Hannah, you're a tree ring, all right? And he said, you know what I wanna do? I wanna take these sporadic PDSI and I want to build a gridded data set and fill in the blanks to give us more data we can use for reconstructions. And he did. And he created this. So Palmer drought. Grid. You can see all those little red dots. Well, Manu student, Michelle Ho, I think last I emailed her was about a year ago. She, I think, is still in Australia. It may have been two years ago. Michelle said, hey, instead of tree rings, let's use Palmer drought and do reconstruction. It's a proxy based off tree rings. Let's, let's use it. It's gridded. I got lots of it. I can get areas that we don't have good tree ring data and it fills in the gaps. Let's try it. Published two awesome papers in WRR doing it and proved it can be done. So I'm sitting around one day since my department head's here, my boss, I'm loaded, got so much stuff to do, I can't, can't even breathe. And I'm like, hey, Ed did this also in Europe. North American drought atlas, old world drought atlas. Hundred and so tree rings, that's the triangles. Over 4,000 Palmer drought points. I go, hey, if Michelle can do this in the U.S., why can't we do it in Europe? Did some lit review, found one thesis of a student at, in Milano that dabbled in this, never published it. Couldn't find anything where anyone's doing any of this. So, wrote a proposal to Fulbright. They were crazy enough to accept it. I said, hey, I wanna do what Michelle's doing in the US, I wanna do it in Europe. So away I go, in 2021 to the University of Trento. Now, I'll show a map, or when you get done, show you where Trento is on here. This kind of shows it. So what do we do? We started doing reconstructions of streams. We started off with the Adige River, which flows right through Trento. I don't have a pointer, but Trento's right up to the left of the A in Adige. Then we went for the big nugget, which is the Po River Basin. About a third of Italy's population lives in the Po. It is a huge provider. You'll hear, hear some more statistics on it in a moment. And then we ventured to the Northeast, started working in Slovenia, and started working on the Sava River there and published a paper on that river. So we started doing this, and it was, it's received very, very positively, not only in the peer review, but also with the community. Concurrently, while I was at Trento, I taught this course called was Hydroclimate Paleohydrology, but I narrowed it down, wrote a course proposal, and again, they were crazy enough to give me a Fulbright. The university was crazy enough to approve this CE 574 Paleohydrology class. And I hope some of our, our uh, NRTers are considerate. Because um, what I'm talking about is what you do in the class with a few add-ons I'm going to talk about in a minute. So the university said, sure. So the Fulbright, we produce some decent papers and also 
uh, generated or developed a new course that we're offering here at UA. So what are we doing now? Well, we did stream flow, now we're looking at precipitation. Now we're looking at precipitation. So again, I mentioned the PO use earlier. I won't read you all these statistics, but the PO is the watershed in Italy. It, you can see Torino here, Turin, Milano, Milan, is within the watershed. You have some cities just outside, if you can kind of get, get a feel for where it is. Trento's just across the ridge from the Po. And we did the stream flow reconstruction, but we wanted to, wanted to see, can we do anything with precipitation? Why? We just wanted to try it, see what we can do with it. So the reason that's driving this is 2022. unbelievable drought in this watershed. Here's just, most of these articles you probably can't read, July 9th, 2022, May, March 29th, 2022, July 1st, 2022, August 13th, 2022. Just, they've never seen, at least they think, drought like they've seen in the Po River. So, again, because Mike didn't give me anything to do, I'm sitting around, bored, and said, hey, let's play around with, uh, I'm going to regret saying that. Uh, um, um, let's, let's, let's do precipitation. So let's look at what we have. So we decided we'd look at precipitation. We'd look at the instrumental record, which they have a wonderful 100-year, roughly, instrumental record of precipitation. We'll define what a drought is, and then we'll go in and we'll compare the instrumental to the, to the paleo and see what we get. So here we go. We're going to look at this, and again, this is something we hope to get out by the end of the year as far as a publication, because I think it's pretty interesting what we found out. First of all, this is the observed instrumental historic data, all those grid points. Now, I'm not going to show the uncertainty bands to, to mess this all up. What that blue line is simply the average across the watershed. What do you see first? It's declining, right? Precipitation's going down in the Po. If you look at it even further, look at my red dots. Five of the lowest seven years have been roughly in the last 15 or 20 years of precipitation. Do you all see those? Five, six, 22, 17, 12. Lowest precipitation in the instrumental record. Okay. Okay, well, we're starting to see maybe why they got a problem. It's not raining. Okay, well, let's look a little bit more. We decided, I mentioned that I did the traditional dissertation. I think we, we had four papers. And the only thing I did above and beyond that was this article. And this was back when AGU EOS was paper. So this was the feature front article to where the Western US drought, how bad is it to where this is what got me interested in paleo. This article is from 2004, so almost 20 years ago. This is where I'm kind of, got, hey, I kind of like this stuff. I want to do this. And as I mentioned earlier, Connie was kind enough to train me. And we, we did this. So we applied this same technique to that instrumental record. And look at what you see with the Po. Look at the droughts they've had going since basically the 1980. Look at these drought periods. 14 years, 14 years, six years. Deficit. Intensity is getting worse of this drought. So it kind of explains why they're having all these issues. Why they're having World War II things show up in the river. And the river's gotten so low. Well, all y'all know about filtering data or smoothing data or running average of data. This is simply a 20-year running average of that same precipitation, smooths it out. Well, guess what? The 20 years that ended in 2022 is the lowest 20-year period we've seen in the observed record. We've never seen anything lower in the Po than this. So again, this precipitation is explaining. So my question, is this the lowest it's ever been? How do we do that? Tree rings. So away we go. 
And first, this is the overlapping period. What am I looking at here? My co-PI on the NSF award that I led is Justin Maxwell. He wrote this really cool paper on bias correction in GRL. The blue line is the observed, the green line is the reconstructed, and the black line is when we bias correct it. The goal is we want the black line closer to the blue line than the green line. Making sense? So we use his bias correction technique. So, and Maddie, I think earlier today, figured out what our problem was with our R code in it. Right, Maddie? Thank you. See, always get students a lot smarter than you. That's the rule, you know. So we, we did that. So we said, okay, we got this pretty good, pretty good reconstruction when you do the overlap or for the overlapping period. What's it look like going back in time? That's what it looks like going back in time. So that's the precipitation going back in time. And what did we find? Barely, barely. We found three 20-year periods that exceeded an almost 2,000-year record. Three that basically exceeded what you're seeing in 2022. So 2022 is pretty significant. I think you all would agree when you've only seen it that low three other times, the precipitation. So. so what's next? The NRT. Okay. So we were so fortunate under Steve's leadership to hit on this award. I was super excited about it. The dinosaur that I am is now playing in AIML deep learning. Very, very scary. Okay. But we have wonderful support. Uh, Jackie's now here, Jackie Gong, his student Andreas has been working with us. Right now, Maddie, Ashley is the two primary master students working with me. I have Kylie and Katie as undergrads. Uh, Kylie's a Randall Scholar, computer person. So we got all four of these ladies helping me out. We have Andreas and Jackie helping out. And we got a cool little team that we're doing in attacking what I think or I hope the mission of, of the NRT is, which is getting AI, ML, deep learning into doing this. So what ends up happening is, is I showed this earlier to where we do everything all to date has been traditionally done with the regression models. And that makes sense. If it's a wide ring, more moisture, narrow ring, less moisture, okay? Even I can figure that one out. But now we're wanting to compare this to AIML deep learning techniques. So what we did, and again, I want to recognize my first round of recognition of the folks I just mentioned. We're, we're, we've got four paper or four posters, four presentations we submitted to AGU, and we're going to see if we get lit up in proposing this idea of AIML to do stream flow reconstruction because we've searched and searched and we can't find many people that are doing it. So we're going to find out. So we think this is pretty cool, pretty novel, and we're getting some really interesting results on doing it. So again, we're going to still do the traditional techniques, and then we're going to compare those traditional techniques. And again, we think there's practical use of this. You can have a long, extend the record to where if you're doing dam operations or things such as that, you can use this data to run it through and take a look at what's going on. So we're excited about that. And again, we'll be out in San Francisco and, uh, and we'll see what the feedback is. I think it's a good way of getting some initial feedback is at the conference and to see if they come up to me, if Ed Cook or if Connie's there goes, Glenn, you need to retire. <laughs> I'd be like, you're right. Um, but I got four kids to pay for. Um, the, uh, and do that. The other thing we're doing is, and I'll mention Capstone International Center here, able to keep this going with Slovenia and Italy, and probably next on my list is Austria and Germany, is the support we get to go study abroad. And again, this was last year's crew 
that we took over there. That's my colleague, you'll see him in another moment. That's Giuseppe Fermetta from the University of Trento. He was my host uh, when, uh, when I was there for the Fulbright. So what's really great is, is being able to get back over there May and June, and I can concurrently be collaborating with my colleagues at both the University of Trento and the University of uh, Ljubljana and keep this momentum going. And again, I hope that it may turn into maybe an NSF, I, I probably mispronounced it, PIRE, P-I-R-E proposal or something in one of NSF's international kind of things. I know there's several uh, NSF REU International, I can't remember the name of the program right now, but there's something that I think we can find a fit for with all this collaboration we got going with students and such going over there. I'll end by mentioning that these are the rivers. That's the Po with my youngest, Allie. That's Giuseppe and I in Trento at the Adige. That's three, I lost one of them, three of the kids. That's the Ljubljana River, which is in the capital there and flows right into the Sava. So um, again, I really wanna thank a lot of people first, my host and good friend, Giuseppe at the University of Trento. My new friend, I uh, was fortunate to go do a seminar at the University in Ljubljana, uh, Neck, who uh, worked with us on the most recent publication. At UA, I gotta thank my friends over in geography, Matt Thero, Lisa Davis, Emily, Elliot, for all their help. Also, Teresa Wise, Carolina, Kelsey, Chad, and Rhoda, that's the capstone team that allows me to venture out and to go over and be able to keep things going and doing these international collaborations. And again, I mentioned they were crazy enough to fund me to go on a Fulbright. Dave Verardo at the National Science Foundation has been crazy enough to fund me twice as a lead PI with the NSF P2C2 program. I don't know what, what got into him, but thank you, Dave, wherever you are. But, uh, and because a lot of this spurred from this. How'd I do on time? 1240-ish. That's all I have to talk about. I'll be glad to take some questions. Thank you all for putting up with me.